The scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The visit of the wise men. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before we begin, it's going to be very important that everyone have one of these sheets of paper. If you do not have a sheet of paper, will you raise your hand high? Lord Jesus, uh, as we begin 2013, we want to be healthy in every way. And I pray, Lord, for our congregation here to grow more than ever with you this year. And I pray today it begins here as our next step in growing spiritually with you. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this is the 12th day of Christmas, as we referred to. And on the 12th day of Christmas, supposedly that was the day, it, tradition has it, that the wise men showed up uh, at the manger. Now, whether they showed up today or some other day does not matter. Notice what they did, and that's what's important. They knelt down and they worshipped Jesus. That was the important thing. They worshipped Jesus. Now, let's review. What does the word worship come from? The word worship comes from the word what? Gift. It comes from the word gift. That which we give ourselves to is what we worship. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. That is what you worship. Uh, what do you think about the most? Where do you spend your time and energy and your finances the most? Not on necessities, there are things that you spend more money, but on the free thing. Where do you spend your time the most? That tends to be what we worship. Now, I, I know it's going to come as a surprise to a lot of us, but a lot of people when they come to a worship service don't come to worship. They come to observe or to consume. They're what we call consumers of worship. They come to be fed. They come not to give, but to receive. They come to observe the music or me. They come to be moved. They come to receive. And if they don't get fed, they get fed up. What are they doing? A lot of people will leave a worship service and say, I didn't get anything out of that. What is that saying? That's saying, I didn't come to give. I came to get because they didn't get anything out of it. Worship is not a place where you come to get True worshipers worship by giving, giving in spirit and in truth. Now, for years, uh, I, I have tried my best to find ways to help people grow spiritually. And finally, this last fall, um, I was at a training event and came across a tool developed by the Excellence in Ministry Coaching, from which our worship team, I mean, our, not our worship team, but the education team took and has developed into this, what we have here. It's been modified significantly to fit our needs for our church. 
And I want you to notice the very top. It says, faith to faith, spiritual workout for spiritual health. In the scripture from Philippians 2, 12, therefore, my dear friends, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, does that mean that if we do all these things, you're going to be saved? No. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 are very clear. We're saved by the grace of God, and it's a free gift. We're saved by Christ and Christ only. But what happens after we're saved? When you and another person get married, the two of you are accepted as one with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities related to that. But are you really one? No, that's the beginning point of growing into oneness. When you and I are baptized, we're saved by Christ and baptized, we are assumed to be at one with Christ, and we have all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities of the kingdom of heaven. But does that mean we are perfectly at one with Jesus? No. That's a beginning point of growing into oneness. The word salvation means to be made whole and complete, which means technically, that you are growing into oneness with Christ. And that means you had to go through the spiritual exercises to, to get there. We're still saved by the grace of Christ, and Christ leads us all along the way. Now, let's look at, well, let me just back up. At, there was a, um, if you work out at a gym, you'll see a lot of people really working out their arms and their chest their back, but not the rest of the body. You'll see others working on their legs, but not the rest of the body. You see a lot of people this time of the year working on their abs, getting ready for the spring and summer, but they're not working out anything else. And you have a lot of people that do the exercises, but they never strengthen their heart. Uh, Mike Fink is a gentleman I work out with, and uh, he and I were talking one day, and he said his son, Wesley, uh, played football in baseball at Clarksville High and then played football in college. And as he was um, uh, being coached by his coach, his batting coach, his batting coach said to him, Wesley, you need to work on your legs and your hips. He said, well, I swing with my arms and my, my, my waist. He said, yes, but you get your power from your legs. You get your power and your swing from your hips. You have to work on that. And the coach said to him, you have to concentrate on developing every part of your body to be a good baseball swinger. And I've heard the same thing say about golf coaches to their people they coach uh, and other people, bowling, whatever the position, you work out the whole body, not just part of it. Now, if you look at this chart on the left, you have faith areas. These are like six different muscle areas of faith. That's the only analogy, that's all it is, is an analogy. But let's say you are a person or you know of a person who has a life of worship and they're all the way to the far right. They are very centered in worship in their life. But then after worship, when it comes to the life obeying Christ, the next line, they don't follow Jesus at all. That means they're exploring. So that's a muscle they need to work on. Or let's say they started being open to the scriptures, but they really haven't developed that. Or a life of hospitality. You, you know a lot of people who've given themselves to Jesus, but you sure couldn't tell about what they say, how they act. You see, to develop a spiritual workout, to be holistic, you have to look at all the areas of faith and develop and exercise all the areas of faith. We don't have time to go all through, the, through all these. Let's just look at the life of worship, just strictly as the first one. Under exploring, the column exploring. One P, I attend worship when a friend invites me, it is convenient or I feel a need. And that's what a lot of people, that's what most people do. I come when I feel like it. What that means is you don't care about worshiping God. You just come when you feel like it. And if that's when you come, then you're not really giving yourself to God. You're a consumer of worship. But to grow in faith, you need to attend worship weekly. Um, it's like a, 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 well, anyway, why would you want to attend worship weekly? Uh, and if you're out of town, attend worship uh, somewhere else. Like Kathy and I, when we travel on Sundays, if it comes 1030 in the morning, we'll stop at the next community and come to the first church we come to and see what God has for us there. We work, I think there's only been one Sunday in the last 40 years of marriage that we did not go to worship somewhere. Um, and, and we love it. It's great. 
Now, there are times I don't feel like getting up to work out on Sunday morning, I mean, on any day of the week to work out at the, at the, at the gym. But when I do it, it makes a difference. But why do you want to do it weekly? Why weekly with a group? Why can't you do it by yourself? All the studies show that, yes, you can worship by yourself, just like you can work out a, at home by yourself. But those who work out physically with a group of people actually accomplish more physically than if they try to do a physical workout by themselves. And the same has been true, discovered about worship. Now, I've referred to this several times. Some of you may be tired of hearing this, but there are a lot of us who haven't heard this yet. There have been over 300 studies done by non-religious folks. I'm talking about sociology departments at colleges, medical schools, medical hospitals, research centers. Non-religious folks. Dale Matthews, who is a doctor, not a theologian, has looked at these studies. And these studies say, does attending worship, they ask the question, does attending worship make a difference in the life of a person? And after doing all these studies, they've concluded, absolutely, 100%, yes, they make a difference. Makes a difference in our life, our marriages, our health. Just as one part of the conclusion, he says, no wonder then that frequency of church attendance, and he doesn't say church attendance, says frequency of church attendance, has been found time and again to be of such important determinant in prevention of disease recovery from illness, achievement of well-being, coping with stress, and prolonging of life. In fact, one study out of Purdue University Sociology Department shows that people who do not attend worship can have the same effects on their health as people who smoke. It's that significant. Attend and it doesn't matter the church. The issue is attendance, being present. So weekly attendance is for our benefit. So let's say you're now attending weekly. And that leads you to, to 2P. I attend worship regularly, but I am growing to realize that I must attend God every day. What do you do? The G for guidance. Develop a daily worship life of praise and prayer. Um, when I lived elsewhere, I was working out at a, at a gym. And this man walked up to me and said, I understand you're a minister? I said, yeah. He, he said, I work out one to two hours every single day because I want my body to be a temple of God. But a temple is a place of worship. And I've come to realize the only time I worship is on Sunday morning. How do I develop a worship life the rest of the week? And I said, well, we'll start simple. And I reminded him that, I mean, he could bench press 500 pounds. I said, you didn't start off bench pressing 500 pounds. You start off what you could do, then you add it to it, and you add it to it. I said, start off daily just praying five minutes. Set a clock. Don't give up. Five minutes. Next week, go six minutes. Next week, seven minutes. Next week, eight minutes. And then after you get to 15 minutes, put the clock away and simply pray and let that relationship develop. I saw him about three months later. Uh, the next time I saw him, he said, it works. I said, what do you mean? He said, you told me to start praying and adding a, a minute a week. It really works. I am more at peace during the day when I take time to pray when I first get up than I am any other time of the year, any other, when, than when I didn't do it. And I go, wow, that's great. And then about a year later, I saw him again, and his prayer life was even stronger. So let's say you're doing that now. That puts you up into 3P. You're deepening faith. I attend worship regularly, and I set aside time daily for personal worship and devotional. That, what do you do next to grow in faith? G, begin praying without ceasing by being Christ-centered as I work, play, dialogue with others. Uh, one of the best examples of this came from a lady who had been visiting our church at a, uh, well, not this one, a previous church I was at. And, and she told me a year earlier, she had been at a worship service in which the, the pastor preached about praying without ceasing. After worship, she had lunch, then she went to the grocery. At the grocery store, the, uh, they, were, they were short on help that day, and the lines were extra long, and she was just very impatient, very upset. And she said, I thought, pray without ceasing. Okay, I'll start praying. So she started praying for the people in line with her. 
And then she started praying for the checkout register and the people around the store. When she got in the car, there was a traffic jam. And she was upset. And she, okay, pray without ceasing. So she began to pray for the people in the cars around her and the people where the accident was that caused the jam. And then uh, the next morning, as she was going through rush hour traffic, she was irritated. Pray without ceasing, she said. So she started praying for the car. And she found herself being more aware of the vehicles around her, so she became a better driver. And, and when she got to work, she began to pray for the people that she worked with. Lord, what do I say? What do I hear? And she said, it was great. She was becoming centered in her faith. And that's the, what you go to next. And so now you're centered. 4P, I honor God in ways I work, play, and engage others in relationships. What do you do then? Well, you become a mentor to one or more persons, helping them in their worship through a small group or through some other ways. Um, Willow Creek Community Church is the church in America that got all this contemporary worship stuff, stuff going years ago. And they kept growing in numbers and numbers. They thought, wow, we are helping people grow in faith. Eight years ago, their administrative officer was sitting in the balcony looking at the 6,000 people in worship and said, are we really helping people grow in faith just because they're here? And because they had the resources, they were able to hire some people who could do some actual studying and measuring. And what they discovered was shocking, that just because people were attending, just because the church was growing in numbers, just because they're every way statistically, didn't mean necessarily that people were going, growing in, in their faith. It meant they were consumers. And so they began to develop, what, what can we do to help people grow in faith? And they developed something similar to this. But the biggest surprise to them was that those who were the spiritual giants of the church, they, they followed them over a period of time. And what they discovered was people who were spiritual, spiritually centered tend to go from church to church. And the reason was, after they became so mature in their faith, the church they were at didn't offer them anymore. And they didn't, the next place didn't offer anymore. The next place didn't offer. They were consumers without realizing it. They were looking for something to feed them. And what they discovered, and other churches are finding the same thing, is when you get to that point in your life, the way you grow in faith is to help others grow in faith. When you're so centered in Christ, what does Christ do? Lead us to help others. And by helping others, as everyone who's been a teacher or professor or an instructor knows, the ones who lead and prepare are the ones who get the most out of it. And so when you get to that point in your life, and I hope everyone else gets to there, help others grow in their worship. And isn't that what Jesus did? Wasn't it in the middle of worship that Jesus took the bread and he broke it? So this is my body which is broken for you? He was so centered, he gave himself away to us even today. And isn't that what he did with his blood? He shed his blood for the purpose of of cleansing us so that we can grow in faith. Now, we don't have time to go through all these others, but take this chart with you and don't just put it away. Use it as a guide for you to grow in faith in every area. But understand this. Lori <laughs> Hadley is great. She gave, gave me the scripture just before the service. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. This makes sense. Listen to it. Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. A lot of people make resolutions. The resolution is, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get physically healthy. Do that. But even more so, grow in your faith spiritually. Romans 12, 1, on the very left of that whole section says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, your whole life becomes your worship. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I, I, I pray for us. I sense there's some of us who really do want to grow 
in worship and giving ourselves. And, and others of us don't care. Lord, I, I pray you help all of us, all of us, to grow in our relationship with you this year. Whether it's through this means or some other means, you help every one of us take a step of faith this 2011. And Lord, I pray a prayer of thanks for this bread that you've given us. Because you don't give it to us just to, for us to receive. You give it to us so that you can, we can give ourselves to you. Lord, I pray you help us not be consumers of the bread, but receivers that give back to you. And when we mess up, Lord, as we receive this cup, Lord, we know that you cleanse us. But you cleanse us so that we can give ourselves to you and each other. Lord, I pray. Help us not just to receive, but to receive for the purpose of giving ourselves to you and be centered in you. Lord Jesus, I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.